Okay, so I'm, I'm Lincoln Stein, and um, I, as we introduced you from the introductions yesterday, you know I work upstairs. And uh, my main uh, area of, of interest is in, uh, is in databases, and I work on a, a pathway database called Reacto. Uh, I'm going to try to give you the, uh, an overview both to um, pathway-based and network uh, analysis of uh, genomics data. A and in honor of um, this being a, a network talk, I've tried to set up the talk as a network with various levels of success, as you'll, as you'll see. Um, the, uh, so we're going to uh, uh, start with, with an introduction, and then I'm going to talk about um, various types of uh, uh, pathways and, 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 and networks and how to, uh, how to get the data. Uh, and then we'll talk about applications of these uh, data in uh, generating hypotheses from gene lists. We'll spend most of our time on this um, uh, because I, th I think that's your, your, that's your major interest. Uh, we'll, we'll touch briefly on um, using networks and pathways to predict the function of new genes. And uh, Quaid will talk much more about that later. And we'll also talk about how um, this type of analysis can, analysis can be used to classify patient samples uh, and, and diseases and, and discover new structures underneath them. Yes, Gary? Just mention that the notes are coming because I think something that's Oh, of course. Uh, and, and because this is sort of set up, this is not a standard PowerPoint presentation, we had some technical issues in getting it printed, but we've resolved them in the, in the uh, manual and, and detailed copies of this will be, will be coming in a few minutes. Okay, so let's start with the introduction here. So, why would you do path? Well, why would you do pathway analysis at all? What are pathways and networks? How are they different? Where can you get the information, and how can you use them to to make uh, to, to do interesting science? So, the idea of of pathways and networks is to further reduce the amount of information. From, from gene lists. So in gene lists, as you've learned yesterday, uh, you can take um, a large number, large number of, of, of genes um, and shrink them down into a smaller number of gene functions using uh, uh, gene enrichment analysis and other tools that you've, you've learned yesterday. But that still gives you, unfortunately, a very, very large list of gene functions. And a lot of the problem in that is the fragmentation of knowledge and, and differing historical perspectives. You have the issue with the Go hierarchy. You have the issue of different uh, groups have annotated genes in different ways. And you still have a lot of data reduction. So pathway and network clustering seeks to take that long and complicated list of functions and turn it into a more discrete um, uh, uh, set of, of pathways or interacting networks such that instead of, um, instead of now having hundreds of functional classifications, you have maybe dozens or, or fewer of pathways or, or networks. It can also help you find, perhaps, um, you know, your, your false positives, things that really do n are not part of the process that you're studying, the, the, the obvious outliers. So uh, a second thing that makes pathway and network analysis uh, useful is that um, they're intuitive. Uh, there's a certain amount of intuition that it gives you uh, as to the biological context. So instead of um, uh, a, a, a whole series of, of disconnected concepts such as uh, mitochondrial inner leaflet, you get a uh, you get out of a pathway or network analysis a more uh, 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 a, a, a picture and a concept of how the genes in your list are interacting with each other, what the regulatory relations relationships are. Um, you can also create you know nice diagrams to explain uh, how your how your genes are, are working with each other. Uh, you can also do various types of computation uh, on the pathway uh, by identifying uh, uh, 
So we can link up processes that uh, you did not know or people did not know were, uh, were connected. Um, you can identify pathways or network modules which are up or down regulated in your system. You can identify potential regulators of the, uh, uh, of the process you're looking at. The basic idea is to take your microarray with up and down regulated genes and turn it into uh, a, uh, a diagram of, uh, uh, of how those genes are related to each other and what, me what mechanisms they, they contribute to. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk basically about three different types of, uh, of resource. One are, are, are pathways in their databases. One are, are networks of interactions. And then I'll touch a little bit on relationship maps, which may or may not be the correct name for this, for this concept, which, which kind of integrates phenotype and genotype. Sure. Inter an interactome is, is, a, is a a, an interaction network. So it's a series of bimolecular um, interactions of various types. We'll, we'll talk more about this between two molecules. Um, so, so in distinction, a pathway is what you intuitively uh, conceive of as a pathway where you have multiple things going into a process and, 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 and coming out. So if you think of glycolysis, with a step-by-step -step kind of goal-directed process, that's a path. That's a pathway. So let's talk. We're going to talk about pathways first. So if you see something which is a step-by-step -step process um, that looks kind of like a chemical reaction or biochemistry, that's very likely to be a pathway database. Most pathway databases are hand curated from the literature. In fact, you can think of the literature as being a big community pathway database in a very disorganized fashion. Uh, it's very, very useful for extracting actionable biological knowledge. So if, for example, you, you realize that a, uh, a, a chemokine pathway is involved in, your, uh, in, 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 in driving your tumor, then you can immediately look at the pathway, identify druggable targets, and come up with a, a, a plan for, uh, for, for, for inhibiting that pathway and, per, and treating the disease. Uh, unfortunately, um, the whole concept of pathway is, is very, very fuzzy. And a lot of what people call pathways are really the result of a, a particular historical trajectory, which might as well have been another. And in particular, the signaling pathways are incredibly interdigitated with each other. They have lots of crosstalk. And the fact that one is called the PDGF pathway, another is called EGFR pathway, a third is called um, you know, uh, uh, FGF or TOR, is, is really a historical accident of what growth factors people were studying at a particular time. And that makes working with pathway databases quite difficult. So the goal of, of pathway databases is to recreate on a very large scale uh, the Boringer Mannheim me metabolic pathways chart, which adorned uh, our, our laboratory, our um, cinder block walled 1960s and 70s era um, uh, laboratories and restrooms. And so this is a, a, a wonderfully hand curated chart of all of intermediary metabolism in E. coli. You can zoom into this and, uh, and see really incredibly detailed information on. How, how small molecules are being interconverted, what, approach, what enzymes drive this, what cofactors um, produce, uh, are, are needed, um, what, um, uh, what small molecules go in and out. And the idea, of, the idea of modern pathway databases is to recreate this, but across all biological processes. Fundamental processes such as DNA repair, signaling pathways, um, uh, neuronal signaling, uh, blood co coagulation, um, uh, you have it, but in, in an online and computable way. So there are, as we'll, we'll see later, there are, there are hundreds of things that are pathway databases. Um, I can't review them all, but I'm going to touch on, uh, I think, some of the, the high, po high points, um, some of the most popular ones and the ones that are, that are most useful. So the, the granddaddy, 
the grandmother of pathway databases is KEG, the Kyoto Encyclopedia uh, of, of, of Genes. And KEG is both a genome database that has information on genes, their proteins, their structure, uh, as well as a curated collection of, of pathways. Um, their basic user interface device is this, uh, <coughs> zooming too much, um, is this biochemical, uh, biochemical pathway in which, wow, okay, the zooming is a little weird. Um, this, this, uh, these chemical maps, they have um, uh, several thousand of these maps that have been hand drawn, and it represents um, each process as an input, an output, and a, uh, um, and an EC number, which is its enzyme commission number. You can immediately see one of the, one of the limitations of KEG is that it's very EC number uh, associated, and, and, and many processes that we'd like to talk about, such as transport reactions, uh, don't map well onto EC numbers. So it makes, it makes using KEG data in an automated fashion a little bit difficult. Um, but it is, it is an, an incredible um, project. They cover uh, over 1,000 species, 5.2 million genes across each of those species, more than 100,000 uh, pathways that have been laid out by hand. Um, these, the, the pathway diagrams are, are manually curated, so somebody has looked at each of these arcs or each, each of these reactions um, and uh, has, has, has dredged it out of the literature. Um, but there's been a lot of computerized assistance, so they've done a lot of projection of uh, pathways from one species to another. So all of intermediary metabolism, for example, started out with a curated E. coli set of maps, and then they were projected onto human and other species via their EC numbers, um, and that has introduced, so you should be aware that that has introduced some artifacts. So um, the, 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 the Projected maps are only as good as the EC mapping, and because the enzyme uh, uh, and uh, because of I I issues in uh, in uh, or orthology and gene evolution, it's um, not a given that a gene that has one enzyme activity in E. coli has exactly the same activity in in human, and so errors can can uh, can can uh, accrue there. It's free for academic use. Um, but because it's not, it's not completely open access, there have been some issues in incorporating keg pathways into other resources. Uh, and its main service, which I'll show you later, is a, is a colorizing service. So you take your gene list, you upload it to keg, it finds the pathways that your genes belong to, and then it'll show you a series of maps with those boxes colorized to show you where your genes are. Okay. So here's another service. Uh, um, this is a uh, uh, this is um, similar in 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 some respects to keg. It's a it's called BioCarta, and again I'm having this weird scrolling problem, which is kind of driving me crazy. Um, so BioCarta is a uh, is a commercial endeavor in which biologists have and, and artists have collaborated to create very detailed, uh, scalable vector graphic images. Of, of, uh, of uh, uh, many processes. Sorry about that. Um, and there are, uh, uh, so you have a, a beautiful series of hand-drawn pathway diagrams. They're, they make great PowerPoint substrates. Um, they have, uh, it's a little hard to get the statistics from them, but they have 120,000 genes in 154 pathways. Most of the pathways are oriented towards pathways that drug companies would be interested in. So they're largely kinase pathways, signaling pathways. Um, and there is a community annotation service that they offer where people can put their own annotations on top of these pathways. They're largely used, the service is largely used by drug companies to pop up, put little ads for their drugs. So if you're looking at a pathway with a kinase in, and as some drug company has a kinase inhibitor, you'll see a little ad for it there. Um, it doesn't have an underlying database. You can't automate it for use in an interpreting gene list. But what you can do is, 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 again, give it a list of genes, and you'll get a set of diagrams out of it, and then look at those diagrams. Uh, here is a, this is a desk, GenMap is a desktop application 
that you can run on your, uh, on your PC. It uses Visual Basic. It consists of a series of, again, hand-drawn uh, biochemical pathways. Um, it, has a, it, has a different over, it has a different focus than, uh, um, than KEG. This one is, is primary, primarily signaling pathways and then high-level biological things such as inflammatory response, he, uh, hemostasis response to, to disease. Um, it provides the same pathway search and colorization services. The interesting thing about, about GenMap okay, is that it is integrated with uh, Wiki Pathways, which is an online community uh, uh, curated set of pathways, um, which currently contains 19 species, 4,300 genes, and 178 uh, human pathways, and many more pathways in other species. Um, the, the nice thing about Wiki Pathways is that you can go to the, the Wiki Pathways URL. Um, uh, look at other people's diagrams, click on them, and then start adding to them. Save them, and they'll be added, and, and they'll then be accessible to uh, other users. You can download them into GenMap and, and work with them for your for your analysis. So it's a nice system. Um, what you, you know, it, but it comes with it the caveats that you have for any wiki. How reliable is the data? It's community annotated. How many people are looking at it? But it does give you the history of you know, of how many people have edited it, and, and, and probably like um, Wikipedia, it's m more accurate than not, not most of the time. Okay, now I work on, on Reactome. I'm hoping I'm not going to be too biased in this. Reactome is a, uh, a hand-curated database that my group has put together over the past 10 years in collaboration with you and Bernie at the, e at the European Bioinformatics. Institute and Peter Distachio at New York University. Um, <coughs> and Reactum is created by inviting uh, authors from the community to come in and write modules in, in, in a database way. We, we, we try to be very, very rigorous about what goes into, what goes into Reactum. So it, um, it has a kind of a, a, a Boringer Mannheim. Uh, chart up here, each of one of which is a reaction. They're, they're connected to each other end to end to indicate the, the sequence of events. Um, they, uh, each of those reactions has a, um, has a series of inputs, a series of outputs, a series of regulators. Um, those inputs and outputs can be small molecules or proteins or, or macromolecules. And everything is, is absolutely explicitly identified. So when we talk about a protein, we are talking about a specific uniprot accession number in that you can look up in, in, um, in, in the data in, in Uniprot. Uh, every assertion has a primary literature reference behind it. So uh, it, it really is run like a, a journal. You can see an author. You can see peer reviewers. You can see what they wrote. You can usually see a picture. And then hiding underneath here is a computable, da a computable database. Oh, I screw it. My zooming is not working at all. So um, uh, Reactome is... Um, uh, covers is a prime is primarily human curation or curation of human pathways, um, but we also project the pathways across orthologies to other species. We cover 22 species, including the, the, the popular model organisms. Uh, currently, on human, we have 4,600 uh, unique proteins, uh, about 5,000 if you count splice splice forms and uh, over a thousand pathways. And it's exportable in multiple, um, multiple informatics, informatics formats, completely open to the community to use. You can reuse it a lot. And the features are same sorts of things. You can find pathways containing genes of interest. Uh, you can, uh, uh, you can do, there's a colorization service, which I'll show you later. We actually do offer a gene list over representation service, which I'll show you where you upload lists of genes or genes and their expression vectors, and it'll, it'll give you a, a p-value and an FDR for participation in a pathway. And there's also an orthology mapping service. So given a pathway in one species, you can uh, find pathways in another. And in our beta version that is um, uh, still in, uh, which is online, but, but, but still needs a lot of work, we're hoping to have it out 
during the summer, um, we have a, a, a nice scrollable Google Maps style scrollable um, uh, pathway display. So you can zoom in and out, you can grab with the mouse and move around, plus a, uh, an interaction overlay service. So here, this is a little bit hard to see, and I'm not sure the zoom is going to work. Okay, this is okay. Here, uh, I've wanted to find small molecules that interact with the H SHC1 gene in um, this EGFR response pathway, and it's going to one of the, 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 the chemical databases, uh, uh, Chemble, and popping up a list of small molecules that interact with, with these genes of interest. And in this view, I've done a similar thing, but, but popped up um, various physical interactions with SHC1. These are genes that are known to, um, to, to physically touch SHC1 by, uh, either by proteomics or uh, yeast 2 hybrid studies, but we don't know exactly what their mechanistic relationship is. So then, um, if you are interested in cancer pathways, um, I strongly recommend the Nature NCI uh, Protein Interaction Database, PID. Okay, this is um, uh, curated by uh, 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 several curators who work for Nature, and they've put their data into, uh, um, uh, in, in, into PID uh, using a data model which, which originally was derived from Reactome and has since diverged. Um, they also import pathways from Reactome and from BioCarta. The nice thing about um, uh, the nice thing about this is it has probably one of the best gene list interpretation functions. Um, uh, do I have pictures of it? No, unfortunately I didn't put in a screenshot of that. But they have a um, uh, their interface is, is very polished, um, and it, 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 again, give it a gene list, it will find pathways that, that um, involve that gene list and show you an interactive colorized version of the, uh, of the pathway diagram. I think my problem here was it was too big for me to paste it in. Okay, then if, you're, if you have money, um, there is a commercial system called Ingenuity. Um, that has been around for, for about eight years. And Ingenuity is an online service. Um, it costs uh, um, over $10,000 a year to subscribe to. Um, it's um, uh, uh, the, the, the algorithms they use and, and their content are unpublished. So you, there's no way to find out exactly what's in there. There's no way of downloading and counting. But according to their marketing literature and, uh, a, a, you know, and, and the one publication they made, it's a, the contents is a combination of, of curation um, as well as integration of multiple data sources from literature mining, from high throughput experiments, from microarray experiments. And they've put together a searchable system called Paris, which is designed to, uh, again, to to, to gobble up gene lists, find processes and pathways which are overrepresented in that set, and then let you, let you, um, uh, uh, then let you explore it. Um, its greatest uh, advantage is that it has uh, good integration with pharmaceutical information. So you can, for example, uh, filter the pathway list only by pathways which are druggable by some, some known uh, a patent, a patented or, or, or non-patented uh, drug. Uh, you can also, it also provides tools to extract and build your own custom pathways and networks, share them with other people, um, and, and save them for, for later use. Uh, and it has a, a, a very, very well-designed user interface. It's nice to interact with, and, you know, and it's been used for a lot of publications. The only, the only caveat is that it costs money, and uh, uh, the methods that they use to construct it are, are, are unpublished, so it's a bit of a black box. Okay, And then finally, uh, the pathway commons is not in itself, in and of itself, a, uh, a pathway database, but it, it is a, a unified collection of information from pathway databases. This is a Sloan Kettering um, project. Uh, Gary, uh, Gary Bader contributed to it. The PI is uh, Chris Sonder. And what, what Pathway Commons does 
is to um, uh, collect pathway and interaction information from, uh, uh, from nine different databases, and it will grow, that number will grow, in a standardized format called BioPax, which is an XML, uh, uh, XML format for representing pathways interactions. And then they bring them together in a common user interface, which can be browsed, searched, and manipulated in, 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 in various ways. Okay. Um, its main advantage is that it provides a uniform interface for tools like Cytoscape to bring pathways down. So Cytoscape no longer has to go to KEG versus one mechanism and Reactome versus a third mechanism and GemMap by, 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 a, by a second mechanism uh, and, 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 and deal with the idiosyncrasies of each of them. It simply goes to Pathway Commons, gets the pathway in its standard format and loads it. Uh, it, the online, so it, it's more a resource for analysis tools to use. It does have an online presence, which provides you with basic summary and searching tools. Um, the best problem, the biggest pro promise of Pathway Commons is that it's going to allow for unification and integration among the pathways, um, so that we have now a unique view of what's known about pathways in the computable form, but that hasn't happened yet. It's, going, it's a very difficult problem. It will be uh, likely uh, more than a year before that, um, uh, before, um, that, is, um, uh, that is in place. And the issue being that KEG and Reactome and, and Wiki Pathways and so on have overlapping, a largely overlapping set of pathways, but because they name the pathways differently, they have different curational, um, curational standards for declaring what a pathway is, um, and they're using different nomenclature even for what's in the pathway. So, you know, Uniprot versus Entree IDs versus EC numbers. Um, it's, it, it, it's hard to ask even the simple question of, is a pathway that's in KEG, um, uh, d does it correspond to a pathway in Reacto? What's, how are they similar? How are they different? Okay. And so here's some screenshots from the, uh, the, the Pathway Commons uh, website. It's showing a, uh, this, this zooming is really bothering me. It's, it's zooming by randomly here. This is the last time I'm going to ask for a Mac. Um, so we're seeing, oh, actually, well, for some reason, we're, we're, we're only looking at pathways from, from Reactome here. Uh, I did a search on it. but. Uh, Usually, you'll see pathways from a number, a large number of resources, and then you can uh, you can select a pathway uh, and and get a get a picture of it. Click on the nodes and arcs and uh, and explore it further. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, so any questions before I move on to uh, move away from pathway databases and start talking about uh, networks? Reactions that occur in one place in one time. Yeah. So, so they're specific to one cell compartment at a certain time. You're better off looking at the hand-curated pathways because curated, you know, unlike the used to hybrid screen, just yeah. specific to the interactions, yeah. it's the hand-curated ones because they're being that, That's absolutely correct. And there are, there are a series of, so a, a typical curation standard requires requires you to ensure that two molecules which are in the same reaction are known to be in the same cell in the same compartment at the same time. Uh, uh, with a few, you know, they also need to be from the same species with a few exceptions such as when you're talking about pathogen host interactions. Uh, um, uh, and and uh, typically, you know, if it's a, if it's a uh, reaction that involves the membrane. One of them has to be known to be bound to the membrane or have a transmembrane domain. So there are a series of human, uh, human checks that goes into these. With an interaction database, you can impose that type of information, but it's not necessary. Not, it, not, it will not necessarily be the case that that's been done. Okay. Any other pathway questions? All right. Let's talk about networks. Okay. So network, so 
One of the problems with pathways is that it's, 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 it's very hard to compute, compute over them. The data model is complex. You have inputs, you have outputs, you have rate constants, you have binding constants, you have various uh, regulators, you have movements between compartments. Uh, and, and, and really, to compute with it correctly, you need to go into biochemistry. You just need to start talking about uh, uh, partial differential equations and really create models. Uh, and that's um, often there's just not sufficient information to make those to make those models that 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 relate to reality. So um, for rapid computation, um, networks have do a, make a big simplification of biology. They say that everything is a bimolecular interaction. So that's the big that's the big simplification. I have uh, protein A and protein B or uh, complex A and protein B, or small molecule A and, and, and small molecule B, and they, they interact with each other. And sometimes that interaction is a very abstract thing, such as a genetic interaction. So say you do a screen for synthetic lethals or en enhancer suppressor screen in your favorite model organism, and you find that two genes are influencing each other's behavior. So you can call that an interaction, uh, 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 an interaction, or they can be physical interactions. You do a yeast two hybrid study, and you find that two genes A and B in a, in a um, uh, target bait relationship um, are um, uh, are physically interacting with each other. Um, that you can create a, a physical interaction on that basis, or two genes are uh, co-expressed. In, in, uh, across many different microarray experiments, and in, in, under different experimental conditions, in different life stages, in different mut mutant backgrounds, uh, and so that suggests that they have that they're either regulated one is regulating the other, or they have a common uh, uh, they have a, 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 a common gene that's regulating both of them. So that would be a co-expression interaction. Or they can share go terms more often than not. That's kind of a weak evidence that they're interacting in some way. Or in the literature, whenever gene A is mentioned, they mention gene B as well, more often than you would expect. That's kind of text mining. Uh, or in fact, you can go to a pathway database and throw out all that detailed information that the curators have labored to put in, and, and instead say, oh yeah, two genes are, are, are close together in the same pathway. They're, they're, they, they, maybe they're interacting. Right. So a network ends up um, and a network ends up looking looking like this, where you have a series of vertexes, and these can be proteins or complexes uh, or, or something even more abstract, like a process. And these are called vertexes or they're called nodes, and they're connected by a relationship, which is in in, in graph theory is called an edge. And then there's some more lingo that comes along with graph theory that you'll hear more about today. Um, if three, if uh, nodes are are, um, are connected in a in a in a circle, uh, or if, if there's a if there's a path which can, can take you from a starting node back to itself, that's called a cycle. And then there are different kinds of edges. Um, there are um, undirected edges like this one where there's uh, they're symmetrical, so it's not saying that that this node is doing something to that node. They're kind of mutually affecting each other in some way, as opposed to a, a, a directed edge in which there is an arrow. And so this is saying that um, uh, node A is, is doing something to node B. In a regulatory network, you'd say this is upregulating node B. You could also have uh, an, 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 an inhibitory arrow where it's downregulating B. And then there are weighted edges where uh, no edges are not uh, created equally. Some are, are, um, uh, are more significant than others. And this is typically used in, uh, in um, predicted uh, intera interaction graphs where you have various types of evidence for interaction and edges which have more evidence behind them will have higher weights. Here are some more network concepts. Got cut off a little bit by my, by my crazy zooming here. There we go. Um, so the, uh, a degree 
is, uh, uh, is, is a, uh, a, a metric applied to nodes. It's simply the number of edges going into or coming out of the, the node. So this node has degree 4. This node is uh, because it has four edges going into it. This one only has degree 1 because it only has 1. The shortest path you'll hear a lot about um, is simply uh, between any two, um, uh, uh, any two nodes, uh, how many hops connect them. So between these two nodes, there is a, uh, uh, the shortest path is 2. Um, if you've heard of the, the kind of the six degrees of separation, the kind of the Kevin Bacon uh, uh, Bacon game, this is, a, um, uh, this is just a shortest path type of exercise uh, in which you choose any two people in the world and you can find relationships that connect them with no more than six hops. And it's actually been, this has actually been established, it's actually a smaller number, it's something like five now. Um, the, uh, um, Sorry, it's five including Facebook or? Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, so the, the original experiments were given a, a name and an address. Can you, by handing the letter off, get it to that person, for person-to-person -person connections? And the number was six. And now with the web and Facebook, it's, it's five or something. And it's, it's smaller in, in certain communities, like in the math community. It's even smaller than that because everybody knows everybody else. And then this is related to the idea of betweenedness or centrality, which is uh, every node is labeled by the number of shortest paths that, go th um, that, that, that traverse it. So you find all the pairs in the network and, uh, um, and uh, uh, calculate their shortest path. There are good graph theoretical algorithms that let you do this really, really quickly. And then you label each node by the number of shortest paths that go through it. And there are, will be one or several which, which are most central to that, uh, to that network where everything passes through. And so these are, these are ba uh, uh, basically um, bottlenecks and in information flow, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, and, so, and these can be very interesting because, well, if you want to knock out a process with a drug, maybe, maybe the, it's a central one you want to go for, or maybe it's the one you want to avoid because it'll be lethal. Okay, and, 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 oh, but before I go on, any, any, questions about, any questions about that? By the way, I, I did this, this by hand late last night. This num the the, the, the between-in-this numbers night might not be correct here. So any, any questions? Okay, great. So let's look at a few cards of uh, how you map biology to a network. So um, basically any, any, any set of pairings can be turned into uh, a network. So for example, uh, the protein-protein interaction, as I've uh, talked about before, it's kind of a canonical example. Um, or, but you can use other relationships. So, for example, a regulatory relationship, a kinase and its, its phosphorylated target, a, uh, an epista uh, genetic epistasis, or even protein sequence similarity. Two proteins have a high BLAST score, so you could, you could give them a weighted edge indicating their BLAST score. And uh, people will talk about network analysis in a very broad way, but there are as many different types of networks as there are relationships, and it's critical to understand what type of network they're, they're talking about. So, you know, here's a, and I borrowed this, I borrowed many of these slides from Gary's talk last year, so thank you, Gary. Here is a, a beautiful visualization of all the proteins in, uh, in, in Uniprot blasted against each other to, uh, to create a network of similarity. And you get this, this gorgeous but probably not very useful visualization of, 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 of protein, protein relationships. Okay. Here's another one. It actually looks kind of similar, which is uh, a, a proteomics, the results of a proteomics experiments in Saccharomyces cerevisiae in which Protein complexes were spun down and then fraction and then uh, 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 um, fraction, uh, fractionated and put into a mass spec machine to uh, identify which proteins are co-complexing with each other, and so you can build a map of which proteins are in complexes with each other. Very similar representation, actually, but um, uh, quite quite different underlying meaning, and you would use it in a very different. So you can build 
networks completely automatically, or you can build them via curation, or you can do, or, or you can do both. You can build ones that have, have both curated and uncurated uh, sides. And this is, um, I'm going to talk about a few of the ways that people make automatic, automated interaction maps. So one of the, one of the most popular ones is to try to, um, uh, to, uh, to do what curators do, but do it automatically. Go into the literature, find uh, genes or proteins which uh, are related to each other, and extract it from the text without having to go through a curator's brain, because computers are faster and cheaper than curators are. And so usually it's from PubMed abstracts, because you can get PubMed abstracts for free. Some groups have gotten access to the entire PubMed corpus, and so can go into the body of the, uh, of the paper. Google could probably do this really, really well. Um, the, it makes, um, um, and, and there are um, a, a, a large number of increasingly sophisticated algorithms for um, sorting, out, for, for scoring when two proteins are likely to be related, for using semantic information to avoid false positives such as, you know, A is not involved in this process with B. You know, you don't, you don't want to say A is not related to B and, and score that as a, rela a positive relationship. Um, but it's, it's certainly not a perfect system. First of all, they're just pro there are problems recognizing gene names. So, uh, and even if you recognize the gene name, uh, distinguishing OCT3 from October 3 is a trivial problem. Even if you recognize that it's a gene name, <coughs> uh, how do you know what species it's in? Um, and even a, even a trained curator uh, often has problems figuring out from a paper what, what species they're talking about. Because frequently they're, they're, they're going to be moving from human to mouse to zebrafish, and they're not clear what, always, the papers are not always clear what experiment was performed in which organism. And then you have gene name problems if you have uh, a paper that talks about hedgehog, is that, a, uh, uh, is that a Drosophila gene, or is this a process uh, in, in the hedgehog uh, animal? Um, and then there are genes that have terrible names, like there's a gene called A in Arabidopsis. And how do you pull out the gene name? The gene name? It's a transcriptional regulator. How do you pick out A? Uh, so it's, it's a difficult problem. There are a number of, uh, uh, of, of tools, though, that do a, good, a reasonably good job at this. Um, one is a, 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 a literature search service provided by Agilent, and they may, uh, have made a free Cytoscape plugin, and you can use it um, really as, as a way of pulling out papers which have something to do with your gene list. So you upload your gene list, you manipulate it in Agilent, and then you can annotate your, um, you can build a network in, in Cytoscape, and then you can annotate your network with papers that have something to do with, with that list. And then there's a uh, 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 internet-based service called IHOP, which is really quite fun to play with. I recommend that you play with it, in which you start out with a paper or with a gene. Um, and, uh, and then from that, you can find other genes or papers that are related to it via literature links. And you can hop from one to the other. And you can quickly kind of explore what's known about, uh, known about your gene. Then there's a whole class of interactions that are derived from high-throughput uh, laboratory experiments, omic-style experiments, yeast-2 hybrids we've talked about, complex, protein complex pull-downs and mass spec we've talked about, genetic screens. Again, these are not perfect. In particular, uh, yeast-2 hybrid interactions um, are taking proteins out of their natural context in the uh, human cell or the Drosophila cell and putting them into yeast. Um, and so they, they're, and they're no longer separate in, in the proper compartment. They're no longer being expressed in the correct context. And so there are a high number of, of true interactions. They're, they really are physically interacting with each other. But, they're, but in the real world, they're probably never, never even being co-expressed. They're never in the same compartment. Uh, so this, from the biological point of view, the, the biological significant point of view, there are a lot of false positives in, in Y2H. For the same reason, there are actually a lot of false negatives as well, because you've taken them out of their context. They're no longer membrane-bounded, for example, and they're not interacting when they should be. 
Um, there are also uh, uh, artifacts that you need to be aware of. There are sticky proteins, actin, some of the ribosomal proteins, which just kind of stick to everything. And so in both Y2H and in mass spec experiments, you'll find some really kind of huge proteins that seem to be connected to everything else. And so those need to be, those need to be removed. And then genetic screens, um, uh, unfortunately, have their own artifacts. Um, a, uh, an epistasis experiment, uh, an uh, enhancer suppressor screen, is actually highly sensitive to, uh, to uh, ironically, to network effects, to the genetic background. So two genes will interact genetically in one genetic background, but not in another, because of the influence of, uh, of, other, of other genes. So it's, it's, a, it's a snapshot that has a lot of false negatives in it. Okay? So um, there, are, uh, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of pathway, uh, of, of pathway and uh, network databases. Uh, 325 of them at last count, according to this very good, well-curated resource called the Path Guide uh, at Sloan Kettering. And no, I'm not trying to, to, to zoom in. I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting seasick with this. There's no scroll wheel on the Mac, is there? Pinch? No, none of that stuff works. Okay. Um, so you can go to this. Um, uh, you can go to uh, Path Guide and uh, you know and, and read about each of these. And, and in particular, the details panel will tell you when the resource was last updated, what its focus on is, what its curational or lack of curational model is, and its holdings when those are known. Um, and it will sometimes give you a link to, down, to download the data set. Okay. So um, here, are some of the, here are some of the popular sources of curated interaction networks. One of the biggest ones is BioGrid, which is located here in, 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 in Toronto, among a, a collaboration among a number of institutions. And this is built um, out of the, the uh, older BIND database, which you may have heard of. These are um, these were created by uh, uh, curators reading the literature and deriving in, and deriving interactions from them. It covers multiple species, uh, 529,000 genes, and it has 167,000 interactions among them. Um, now, on the other hand, there is the intact database at EBI, which also has a curational model. They're covering 60,000 genes with 203,000 interactions. Now, you'll immediately notice that there's, some, there's, it, it, there's a crazy imbalance here in the terms of the number of interactions per gene. Um, and this is, this is coming from the different curational models, what their standards are for calling an, for calling an interaction. So intact it has a very low definition of what an interaction is. BioGrid has a very stringent one. Uh, and, and they also have way, different ways of, of, group, of, of grouping the genes together. Uh, and so you have to be very, very cautious about interpreting the data that comes out of, out of, these, out of these databases. Uh, another one sort of intermediate between them is, is Mint. It's an Italian resource. Uh, again, curated interactions uh, from literature primarily in, um, uh, primarily in, in yeast, it's 31,000 genes and 83,000 83, interactions. So usually, uh, I, so I, I, I would say that it is um, very difficult to use these primary sources of network, inter uh, of network interaction, uh, these primary interaction network databases uh, as is. Um, you'll get very different answers depending on what, what database you, you go to. They have different standards. They have different definitions of what interactions are. Uh, it's, it's better, in my opinion, to adapt integrative approaches in which multiple sources of interaction information, multiple networks, are with, with different, different types of experimental and literature, um, uh, literature evidence are combined together to, um, uh, to create an a, 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 a integrative network which tries to capture the, uh, the interactions which are well supported and separate them from others. So the idea being that if there are multiple sources, say that two genes are interacting with each other, 
they're like, it's more likely than if only one out of the many sources does so. And here's a very simple example from uh, 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 Mark Vidal's lab. So uh, uh, Vidal's group did, uh, has done uh, many Y2H screens on yeast and, others, and other species and observed the false positive problem very early on. But they found that uh, by uh, taking interactions and combining that with uh, basically filtering that by gene co-expression and subcellular compartment data so that they throw out any interactions which are not in genes which are co-expressed uh, and or in the same compartment, they are able to re remove most of the false, false positives. And they created what they call date hubs and party hubs to, des to describe them. A more complex example would be to take um, yeast to hybrid data, combine that with proteomics and, and curated data um, with literature, literature mind data, co-expression <coughs> data, gene ontology data, and to build a kind of a machine learning system or a statistical system to classify things based on the weight of evidence towards them. And I'll, I'll talk about one, one such effort. So here is a, an, an, a, an example integrated network, uh, which I'll talk about because uh, it, was, it was done in my group by, by Guan Ming Wu, and so I know, it, I, I know the example best, but I'm not saying that this is, the best, this is uh, the best approach. There are many, many, it's a very active area of research, and there are many groups that are working on it. So we were very concerned, the motivation for this, we were, we were concerned that Reactum was being underutilized, and when we talked to biologists about, why, about it, they said, well, you know, I, I do my screens, and when I ask for pathways, you know, 80% of my genes are not even in reactome. How can, how can I use it when, when it's got such a, a when, when you don't have enough coverage of the genome? And even with our, even our, at our current curation rate, even with, we have basically eight curators working on this, uh, we're, only, we're going to hit 5,000 proteins sometime this year, but that's still, and that's over five years, about 1,000 proteins a year. Um, we're still only you know, uh, at, at a quarter or less of, of what's in the genome. And so we wanted to increase our coverage. Um, so the concept here was to, to create a corona around uh, reactome, uh, uh, around reactome uh, core pathways, such that we would have a core of curated genes with, with their correct regulatory relationships and all the evidence supporting them. And then we would have a corona of less well-characterized interactions derived from literature mining and high, throu and high throughput data. Um, but because we consider ourselves a, 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 you know, a high quality curated database, we didn't just want to start adding all the interactions from all the databases. Uh, we, we wanted to add these cautiously so that we had a high probability of hitting, of, of, of having a, a, a correct corona. So we, um, we, we uh, derived from our corona um, uh, information from uh, many other pathway databases, some that I've talked about, some that I didn't have time for, bimolecular interaction <coughs> databases such as BioGrid. We actually started mining uh, intera interactions from other species, yeast, worm, and fly, and project them into possible interactions via their orthologs in human. We used share go terms because two things are somewhat more likely to interact if, they sh if they're in the same biological process than other, or in the same subcellular compartment than others. Uh, we, we downloaded basically all of GEO and did a, uh, a co-expression, uh, made a co-expression matrix and took things which are highly co-expressed. We mined a database of transcription factors and their targets, and we used a a, uh, the Geneways literature mining effort from Andre Rajetsky at University of Chicago to find, um, uh, to find genes which are co-mentioned in, in the literature and created a, and, and this, was, this is published in the, uh, um, uh, in, in the uh, article that we, we gave you in your, in your uh, material. Um, and then uh, and this created a, a huge network in which everything was connected to everything else. And then we, and, and we which have a very, very high rate of false positives. And then to remove false positives from, the high, from um, this network, um, we took re the, re the reactome data set, which was curated that we feel confident in, and used, used a, a series of algorithms to reduce everything in reactome to a set of, of high confidence 
bimolecular protein interactions. So everything that's in a complex get, got turned into a series of molecular interactions. Um, inputs and their catalysts uh, interact, catalysts and the outputs interact, and so on. We had a whole series of rules for just determining what was an interaction and what wasn't. And so this gave us a, a training set of interactions that we felt, of functional interactions, that we felt were significant. Okay, then we used a machine learning system. Um, a, a, we, the very first one we tried was a naive Bayesian classifier, which is a simple one and, and actually seemed pretty stable, worked pretty well for us. We trained that classifier using the protein interaction pairs derived from curated reactome um, uh, pathways. And f as a negative training set, so you have to train these systems both with a positive set of things that are true and a negative set, set of things that are false, we just chose random pairs of proteins from the genome. Where be, under the assumption that two proteins in the genome are, um, uh, are, are highly unlikely to, in, to interact, which is debatable, but it's, it's, it, um, it's probably a, a better negative training set than others that you can come up with. And uh, then after the training, we did a test of this um, using a, a tenfold cross validate. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, just a, one further question about yeah. negative training sets. Yeah. Is there <clears throat> Is there any utility in in restricting those interactions, or rather than going random, mm. taking deliberately taking protein pairs from the different subcellular compartments and saying like a nuclear one and a cytoplasmic one, a, you know, ones yeah. where you know they don't. Yeah, cross. that was that was the very first thing we tried, and the problem with that is it um, it was such a strong signal that it trained the classifier to use the go compartment as its major piece of evidence. So, you know, yeah, so anything that was in the same compartment within it was then so much more likely to interact that, that it was just wasn't performing well. Uh, I actually, to back up a little bit and give you the, the, the background of what, the, what a classifier does, the idea that the classifier then acts as a black box. You give it two proteins and it gives you a probability score. High probability that they interact, low probability that they interact, and then you have to choose a cutoff to say, yes, they do or they don't. Um, the way you te um, now, um, ideally, you want to test this empirically. You want to make predictions, and then you test them in the lab. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the obvious ways of doing it, such as with yeast two hybrid targeting bait, we'd already, or, or going into the literature, we'd already brought all those pieces of evidence in. So you actually have to put it out and then wait for new, new, new science. Um, so, but you can in test it internally by doing something called a tenfold cross-validation, where you, um, you train with 90% uh, with, 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 um, or you train with 50% of your data, of your, your, um, your positive and negative training set, and then you uh, validate it by testing it with the, uh, with the part of your training set that you with, you've withheld, okay, to see how well it can predict the whole from the, from the part, and you do that multiple times. And that, from, from that, you can calculate the accuracy. And what this one then can give you is something that's called an a, 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 a infinitely zooming receiver operator curve. All right, I'm just going to leave it here. Um, and so what this is doing is it's graphing the false positive rate from a 0% false positive rate to a 1% false positive rate against the, 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 the true positive rate going from 0% true positives to 100% uh, 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 true positives uh, at different thresholds for the cutoff. So you, you give, give it two pairs of proteins, it gives you a, a probability from 0 to 1, and then you can choose different levels of that cutoff. You can say 0 0.5, or 0 0.4, or 0.3, and, it'll, and under that threshold, um, it will, you know, um, if you declare that everything that's greater than has a score greater than 0.4 is an interaction, you can then measure it against the part of the data set that you left out to see if did it call it right or did it call it wrong. Now, a really, really good um, uh, um, uh, rock curve will will look like will look like this. It'll be it'll be uh, it'll it'll have a right angle so that the uh, so that at a false positive rate of zero, it'll immediately zoom up to a true positive rate of one. Uh, random will look something like something like this, you know, a diagonal line, 
where it's just randomly calling things and it's about 50% right each time. Uh, and, and so um, this is actually a fairly, a fairly nice one uh, where you know, it, it has a very, very high uh, rapid slope. Um, and so uh, you know, I increase the false positive rate just a little bit, except a little bit of false positives, and the true positives go up quite, quite, uh, quite rapidly. And so we can get close to you know, 90% accuracy if we're willing to accept a false positive rate of 20%. But we weren't willing to do that, actually. Uh, and we, whoops, and we took a, uh, a very, very conservative threshold for this that gave us a false positive rate of under, 100, uh, under 1% for our network, and, and then accepted a lower true positive rate of 20%. Okay? And, that's the, and, and so that's, that's the foundation of, of the reactum functional interaction network. You can argue that we might have wanted to choose a, a different threshold for that, but we, um, you know, be, because network analysis is so sensitive to false positives, we wanted to keep them as low as possible. Also, I believe that this, is, this analysis is underestimating our error, our error rate. Okay. Right. okay, so what does that give us? That gives us a big fuzzy hairball. We're looking only, only at 15% of the network in, in the cytoscape here. But it has greatly increased our coverage from less than 5,000 proteins to almost 11,000 proteins. And that includes uh, 209,988 in interactions, which is a fairly good number. And, and what, we have, what, what we now have is a, a mixed network that consists of curated interactions from reactome. So, of course, we didn't throw that out. We used it, plus the the predicted ones from the Bayesian classifier. Okay, and in, in the paper uh, I, I gave you, we used it to do a very blah, simple analysis of glioblastoma multiforme mutations from the TCGA set and show that you can cluster this and pick out apparent functional modules in this. Um, so before I before I go on, are there any questions about Build, uh, how we built that network and, 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 and what it means. Okay, and I just want to also emphasize that this is just one effort of many, many. There are kind of hundreds of papers published on this field every every year, using some are using much more sophisticated techniques than, than we used. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to touch very quickly just on a, on a, on a different type of, of, of network map. Um, and these are, I don't think, know if this is the correct, this is the official name for them. I call them relationship maps, where we're uh, creating uh, maps of concepts rather than maps of, rat maps of genes. And relationship maps are developed for the problem of integrating, doing semantic integration of knowledge. Different pathway databases um, cover the same processes, but they have quite different names for them. Are, are these processes the same ones? Are they overlapping? Are they partially the same? Are they completely distinct? And so just, you know, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, vascular development, are, are these the same? Are they different? Sometimes you, you can't tell. And so the, the relationship maps take gene information, typically, and integrate them with, with phenotype information to discover how, how, these, uh, how these, these concepts are, are, are related to each other. So a, 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 a very nice paper that appeared a few years ago was on the, the human uh, disease network. And essentially, uh, what they did here is they, they took OMIM, which is the, online, the database uh, of the online Mendelian inheritance in man, which is a curated database of diseases. And for each disease, some curator has read all the literature about that disease and has assembled both the description of the disease and its clinical phenotype and its treatments and so on, plus a list of genes which are thought to be involved in that gene. So you have uh, a relationship. You can extract a relationship between a disease and the genes that are involved in it. And they built up a very, very large um, network like this in which um, they, have, they have diseases, and each disease has one or more edges going towards the, the genes that have been um, uh, have been described in them, and they, I believe they used a weighted graph where there's some confidence that they belong, they belong together. And then from that, they're able to 
um, they're able to do a, a network-based clustering. So two genes uh, are likely to be related to each other if they're connected by a common disease. And a whole group of genes are going to be connected together if they're related by a common disease. And on the, side, on, on the other hand, a series of diseases may be related to each other if they, if they share more genes in common than you would expect, and you would expect by chance. And so they created two networks. I'm scared to scroll. Uh, one was a, 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 a disease network where they are connecting each, um, uh, each disease, to, uh, 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 each disease to, to every other one via a weighted graph in this case where the edge corresponds to the number of genes that connect them, and the size of the nodes is the number of genes involved in that disease, so it's related to its, uh, its degree. Okay, recall? So the size of the node is degree and the number of, of genes in the disease, and the, uh, the, 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 the width of the edge is the number of genes that connect the two. Okay? And so this is what they came up with. They came up with two, with two um, uh, uh, Two maps: one of the one of the diseases and one of the um, uh, one of the genes, and it made some very nice connections that um, are intuitive. So diabetes and obesity are connected by a lot of genes, so they, they cluster together. And then some ones which are are less obvious. Well, all right. So we have colon cancer and breast cancer together and lymphoma. Oh, where was it? Yes, Fanconi's anemia, which of course is a DNA repair problem, a DNA repair disease. That, that, is clustering with the, that is clustering with the cancers. Okay, but then there are some less obvious ones here, which I'm, I'm not going to be able to find because I'm in infinite zoom mode. Do they separate genders? Um, I, I don't believe they did, but I, I, I haven't, it's been a while since I read the paper, so I, I may be wrong about that. Uh, in this, under the same, the same way, they are able to cluster genes by their... Um, uh, uh, by the diseases that they share. This is the same thing turned inside out. And, and sure enough, it, it does some obvious things. It puts P53, uh, or it puts all, a lot, many of the signaling uh, 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 genes together. Um, and it does a few inobvious things too, which again, I'm not going to try to find. But it's, a, it's, it's, a great, it's now a great resource for exploring. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay. Yes, Charter. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, you can go to the. There's a URL in the in the paper. You can browse it. You can download it. Okay. Uh, how am I doing for time? I have 25 minutes. Okay. All right. <coughs> so I've talked about the different kinds of uh, the uh, different kinds of networks and pathways. I've talked about where you can get them. I've talked about building integrated um, networks. Now I'm going to talk about using them. Uh, applying them to interpreting gene lists, I spend most of my time talking about uh, hypothesis generation. Okay, so before we start, it, it should go without saying that um, uh, the quality of what you goes at, what, what what comes out in terms of hypotheses, is directly related to the quality of what goes in. So before you start, you need to. You need to correctly normalize your arrays. You need to subtract out background. You need to do quality control to remove things which are, uh, uh, which are uh, obviously wrong. Um, do all the, run all the statistical tests that, you, um, that are appropriate to reduce the number of uh, the amount of noise in your experiment. And in particular, false positives are going to give you a lot of false associations. Uh, and uh, be aware of the ID requirements for the particular software that you're, you're intending to use. So using the tools that we discussed yesterday. So make sure that if it wants Uniprot IDs, you're using Uniprot IDs. If it wants Ensemble IDs, it's using, it's using those. Okay? Okay, um, we'll briefly, we'll briefly touch on, on pathway colorizing services, um, which are, um, are very straightforward to use. I'm going to give you two examples. One is from Keg. Didn't, that screenshot didn't come out too well. All right. Uh, so Keg has a has a, a, a pathway mapping service uh, in which you can upload um, lists of genes 
in a variety of formats. Uh, you can use Hugo IDs, which is what I used to, to make this screenshot, or you can use KEG IDs, or you can use uh, Unipro SwissProd IDs. Um, it will then attempt to map those to its internal IDs and give you a report on how many mapped. Okay, and, and here we're seeing the result. It's telling us which ones were not found. I had a lot of non-hits here. Uh, and then it'll give you a list of the pathways um, uh, that it knows about and the number of IDs that were in those pathways. And then you can click on the links, and for each one you'll get a nice little chart, and it will show you the gene, the gene on your list in the context of where it is in the pathway diagram. And then you can, you can, uh, uh, you can scroll, th scroll through that, click on, the, uh, uh, click on the nodes to get more information about it, and make your own mind about how it is used. Okay, here's Reactome's version of this. It is uh, really, really, you know, extremely simple. You upload a series of IDs. We try to be very, very um, proactive about what IDs we accept. So you can give it entree. Uh, I, you can give it entree IDs, you can give it ensemble IDs, you can give it uniprode IDs, you can give it Affymetrics probe numbers from a variety of popular microarrays. Um, and um, I, think that's, I think that's it. And then it'll try to guess. It'll then give you um, uh, this uh, kind of a big page where it has multiple sections. At the bottom of it is a list of, uh, of how it did its mapping. But at the top, where it's most useful, is a, uh, is a ranked list of uh, overrepresented uh, uh, pathways uh, and their p-values. And this is using uh, a hypergeometric test, the, Fisher, the, the, the Fisher's one-tail test that you heard about yesterday. Uh, you, can then, um, uh, you can then zoom in, in on these and look at pathway diagrams or look at the database records. One of the features that we offer is a zoomable version of the uh, of our pathway map, where it bleh, okay. Well, I have to stop doing that. Uh, where it um, it highlight it highlights the genes that were in your list. If you have um, and, and one of the options allows you to turn on a, a, a color scale, so that uh, it'll give you the significant. It'll show you the significance values. Here I'm just I'm just showing them all. Um, you can also uh, upload a, a, a time course, and it'll give you a little movie. So it'll give you an animated GIF, so you can see how your, the pathway map changes with time. Or you can give it expression values and have upregulated genes, upregulated pathways, uh, turn red, and downregulated ones turn blue. All right. Okay, and then you can you can zoom in to see the to see details on a particular uh, a particular pathway. Yeah, okay, and, and the new the beta version will also support this, but I, I highly recommend that you don't try this yet because I tried it yesterday and it was not uh, it was not working quite right. Okay, um, and that's all I'm going to say about about um, uh, about pathway colorization. It's basically a, a way to orient you, but you have to do all the hypothesis generation generation yourself. Okay, so any any questions about that? Pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a more interest, and, and again, and, and another big limitation is that it's a pathway database, so it's, it's only covering a little piece of your, your gene list. It's going to have a high um, rate of not being, not being able to say anything about most of your genes. Hey, sure. No, I'm sorry. Um, so um, we're, we're not do, we're, we're not doing a Reactome tutorial or anything. But if you go to Reactome, you will see uh, up in the top you'll see a, a link that says "Try our new beta," and you can try our new beta. But the um, uh, the, the expression analysis as of yesterday, when I tried to do it, did a screenshot of it, was not working quite right. And it may work next week, but. Um, no, just just wanted just wanted to warn just wanted to warn you, okay. But the, we're this afternoon we're going to do a uh, um, a demo and a lab involving uh, a beta release version of a of a of a Cytoscape plugin which fetches data from re, from the Reactome functional interaction network and does various things on it. 
Um, that's beta, but it actually works pretty. It actually works pretty well, and will will likely be released in the next next couple of weeks when the user interface is polished up just a little bit. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, working with uh, interaction networks and trying to derive derive hypotheses from them. And the, the nomenclature here is it's called active subnetwork extraction. All that means is you have a big network. You start out with a big network that encompasses 50% of the genes or more of the, in the genome. And you extract from that the subset that you're interested in. So for example, the subset of genes which are upregulated in sample B versus A in your microarray or RNA-seq experiment. And then you build from that a subnetwork of how these interesting genes are interacting with each other, and then you, you, you build hypotheses out of that. All right. And so the paradigm here, and this was stolen from a poster, so it's, it's reactome oriented, is you start with the, the, uh, um, the big interaction network, you extract the genes of interest, the ones that are mutated in your, in your cancer cell line, the ones that are overexpressed in your treated cell lines, undue expressed, underexpressed, the ones which are, have a C, are involved in CNVs. Um, and then optionally, you can add some linker genes of things which were, these are genes which were not actually on your list, but are, 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 are central. To the, to the process that will, will tie them together. So you might actually have picked up a little bit of the same process here and a little bit there, and the linker gene will, will, tie, them to, will tie them together into the same process. Um, sometimes you want to do that, sometimes not. You can do then, typically you then get a, a, a big fuzzy hairball, and then you can use various clustering algorithms. I'll tell you about one, and, and um, you'll, you'll hear about others this afternoon to uh, break them into functional modules. Uh, and then from that, you can go on to, to examine those modules. So these are genes which are heavily interacting with each other to do hypothesis generation, sample classification, and, and, and gene disease gene prediction and other good things. Okay. I'm going to give you an example of this from a project that's going on in my lab now. Um, and it's in collaborate. It, it, the, the person responsible for this is Irina Kalitskaya. It's a postdoc in my lab, and she's collaborating with Peter Dirks, who's at the University Health Networks, um, yeah, UHN, not UNH, um, uh, here in, in Toronto, who's looking at um, brain cancer stem cells. And so the the um, model is this: they have. Uh, isolated stem cell, they have flow sorted stem cells out of patients, out of tumors from patients with glioblastoma multiforme to create a population of, of, uh, of, uh, self, uh, of self perpetuating uh, tumor stem cells. Uh, and at the same, in parallel with this, they've isolated uh, normal neural stem cells from, uh, um, from uh, fetuses. And uh, they have many of the same. They have many of the same markers. They have many stem cell properties. But the one big difference is that um, if you grow the neural stem cells in a rich medium containing bovine serum albumin and other growth factors, and then remove the medium, they will differentiate into a variety of, of, of neural of, of, of mature neural stem cell, neural cells, uh, neurons, uh, astrocytes, and so on. The brain tumor stem cells, um, if you remove the, the, the rich media, they will continue to grow in an undifferentiated fashion. They'll sometimes throw off some things which are look like look a little bit like look like astrocytes, but are, are are not normal astrocytes. And so the question is, what's different between these two populations of stem cells? And so this is, it's a straightforward microarray experiment where they compared several. Um, tumor stem cell lines to several um, uh, fetal uh, normal neural stem cell samples, they found uh, over 1, 1,300 differentially expressed genes, either ones which are significantly up or down regulated in the two sets. Um, they, they then published this data set a year ago with some, uh, some observations, such as they found that beta catenin is, is very highly expressed in the uh, uh, cancer stem cells. They then um, asked us to have a look at it in our network. So what Arena did is she extracted the active subnetwork 
from uh, the, the, the functional interaction network. 716 out of the 1308 were in the network at all. So 55% hit rate is pretty much what we expect from our coverage of the genome. Um, these were more, then we did some basic statistics on them. One of the most interesting is that the, the, the genes that are up or down regulated are, are, are more connected with each other than, than random genes. So in the, in the functional interaction network as a whole, um, the, the shortest distance, the, shortest, the average shortest path is 3.82. So the distance between any two genes is 3.82 hops. And it's 3.58 in this set, which is not that big, but it's statistically significant. She then added um, a, a series of highly connected linker genes uh, until the shortest path length started to increase. Okay, so we, st we stopped when, it, when they started getting uh, um, uh, uh, less well connected. Uh, and then we, we used a community clustering algorithm um, called uh, edge ed Gavin Newman edge betweenedness. Um, that was originally developed for analysis of the web and, and Facebook sites to find communities that were highly interconnected to create uh, um, uh, several cl 20 clusters uh, that consisted of 10 or more genes. Now, this is what the thing looks like in, in, in Cytoscape. You'll be able to generate those um, using the, um, the, the plugin that we'll talk about this afternoon. And there are some, may, may some may, may obvious things in here. So here we, I've, we've circled the, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the modules that are highly interconnected. Uh, some of them that were expected, like beta-catenin, which had previously been published, came up. P53 always, uh, P53 always comes up, Hox cluster here. And then some of them were less, uh, 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 were not, were, were more surprising. And each of these modules tells a story and generates a hypothesis. I'll take you through just a couple of them to give you a sense of them. So one of the big clusters was a big GPCR cluster, which initially looked very un uninteresting. But when we zoomed into it and superimposed the expression data, uh, it started to get very interesting. So what we're seeing here is the, um, is the network. And notice that there are actually two kinds of edge. There are these directed edges. These are curated interactions from reactum where we know what the regulatory relationship is. And sometimes it's an arrow, and sometimes it's one of the, the T-bar in inhibitions. For various reasons, there are many more positive and negative inhibitions in our set. And then the dotted ones are predicted interactions from the Bayes classifier. Um, triangles are linker genes. Uh, red nodes are upregulated in cancer versus uh, 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 normal neural stem cells, and blue is downregulated. And what you immediately see is that there's this little cluster of uh, angiogenic chemokines, which are upregulated. There's also upregulation of uh, angiotensin and the endothelin receptor. Okay? Then there's upregulation of downstream things which are connected via linker genes with all these positive regulations. Right? So the interesting thing, there are two interesting things about this. One is that glioblastoma is known to recruit vasculature, and so it's, you know, um, uh, and so it, it's, it's interesting that it's making angiogenic chemokines, so it's, it could be using that to recruit blood vessels. But even more interesting than that, um, it's uh, expressing both the, uh, uh, both the chemokine and it's expressing the, uh, uh, expressing, uh, the, the, the endothelium and VEGF receptors for that chemokine, which is uh, suggesting an autocrine loop, which hadn't previously um, been described. It, it, it is known that uh, uh, tumor stem cells Induce, do induce angiogenesis more efficiently than normal neural stem cells do in the literature, so we could have predicted that. So that's, that's a nice thing. Uh, then if we look at another cluster that's highly connected to this one, the CREB cluster, so that's a, trend, it's a, a CAMP uh, regulatory element, uh, we find that uh, a CREB was brought in as a linker gene, but everything downstream and upstream of it is upregulated in the tumor stem cells versus, the, the, uh, the, uh, versus the, the normal ones. 
Okay, I'm not going to go into what CREB is. It is known to promote cell proliferation and to be upregulated in some cancers, which is good. But the cute thing about this is there's extensive crosstalk between the, the chemokine um, cluster and its, and its receptor and the, and the CREB cluster. So it, 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 uh, it, it suggests that, what, that what's happening is there's angiogenic uh, chemokines are coming in here, binding to the receptor. That's then turning on, activating uh, phosphorylating CREB, and it, it's then inducing this very large uh, family of genes which are, uh, promote growth. And so we have another autocrine loop. Yeah. So, so that does suggest an upregulation of CREB activity, just not one at the but transcriptional level. Exactly, exactly. So CREB, in this case, its mechanism of regulation is by a, a phosphorylation event, which you don't pick up in the microarray, but it's there. You, but it came in as a linker gene, and so we, we picked it up as a possible, have, playing a possible role in this hypothetical uh, autocrine loop. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. Okay. Here's another one, which is it, it, very, very straightforward, IL-6 is upregulated and its receptor is upregulated. It's actually a very nice diagram that came out of this. Um, and uh, this is the uh, IL-6 autocrine loops are, have been identified in lung and breast cancer, not previously in glioblastoma. That's interesting. But then there's, an, um, uh, there's this obs correlated observation that the, these, these brain, one of the things that differentiates these brain tumor stem cells from neural stem cells, normal stem cells, is that normal stem cells um, are very sensitive to, to a variety of uh, chemotherapeutic agents, and the brain tumor stem cells uh, are resistant, and they seem to have the, the phenotype of multiple drug resistance. Well, IL-6 is uh, associated with multi-drug resistance, um, and uh, uh, The me mechanism from the literature, the mechanism for this is thought to be that IL-6 is upregulating the expression of, of a series of ABC transporters, which, which pump the chemotherapeutic agent out. So the ABC transporters are actually not well represented in our functional interaction network because they are membrane bound, and a lot of a lot of the a lot of the trans channels um, just uh, don't come up in screens. The screens well. But we were able to go back to the microarray data set and look at the ABC transporters. And um, sure enough, one of them, ABCC4, um, was, was highly upregulated. And in fact, when we graphed the cell line, when we graphed the, the fold change in IL-6 against the fold change in ABCC4 transporter against each of the cell lines that went in, we find this beautiful linear correlation between, between the two. Um, and so now we're going back to these cell lines to see if the ones which have high ABCC4 are more chemo-resistant than others. So we got another hypothesis uh, just by kind of staring at the network and, and uh, thinking about the thinking about the, the literature. Okay, so that's all I wanted. To, that's all I wanted to say about it. But I wanted to give you a flavor of how uh, you know how how this actually can get you get you to leads quite quickly. Yeah, questions about that? Yes, yeah, so just that. I assume that that runs. Yes, and so we can do exactly that analysis. The blue red is that binary, or is that a continuous variable? Do you just put yeah. it in up or down, or do you actually put down the raw oh. data? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to try to zoom back there, but uh, yeah, so that that's actually a function, a cytoscape that you can map um, uh, expression levels or any quantitative number onto colors, and so that's actually something you do after you load the network. Yeah, and Gary's going to show you how to do that. So you can you can make it binary, or you can make it a, a heat map, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, no, I'm sorry about that. Uh, these are uh, I, I um, Arena made these by selecting those edges and, uh, and 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 changing them, changing them to red. So in Cytoscape, she kind of dragged over them to select them, and she made them red just this is to highlight them. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, well, so 
the so um, the the uh, you can choose r right now in the plugin you'll see you can choose whether or not to bring in linker genes, but you don't have control over the over the number of linker genes to bring in. Uh, the it's it's um, it's actually so it's actually problematic because if you bring in too many linker genes, you're just going to swamp out your you're going to swamp out your signal, and uh, and everything will be connected to everything else. If you don't bring in linker genes, you may miss interesting biological connections, which didn't happen to be in your. Thing. So the way Irina does it is she 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 actually brings in the linker genes in, in steps um, until she qualitatively feels that the modules are getting too interconnected and stops. The way that the, um, uh, the plugin does it is a, uh, an, an experimental procedure uh, in which we bring link linker genes until uh, a series of measurements, including the, 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 the number and size of modules and the, uh, um, uh, their, and their shortest path, their average shortest path within them, uh, starts to increase towards randomness, and then we stop. Okay, but it, 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 we actually should be able to give you much more control over that, and we don't currently. Yeah. Is that plugin in your program? It is in, in your uh, in your uh, on the wiki and in your uh, the notes that you were in in your um, the email that Michelle sent you, where she gave you a series of of um, uh, a software to install. Yeah, I it's something. Oh yeah, it's inside escape. The plug is the plugin is inside escape, and then the part that does most of the most of the math and database access is actually sitting in Reacto. So you need an internet connection to work for it to work. Okay. No, and, and guys, if you work for, if you have IP issues, you should be aware that what the plugin is doing is it's taking your gene list, upload, sending it to Reacto, and then using that to download the active subnetwork. So the, the, your, your list is actually leaving your domain and entering Reactome's domain. We don't keep it or log it or anything. But you, if, you, if you have IP issues, you should be aware, you should be aware of that. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? I, I have a feeling I'm, uh, I'm running out of time. How much time? Zero. Minus, minus, two. minus two. Okay, so we'll cover everything very, very quickly that I wanted to talk about, um, you heard a little bit about this um, yes, um, yesterday at the end, uh, the gene set en enrichment maps. This is a, an, um, a, a, an orthogonal approach, different approach for clustering gene lists by their, their relationships on networks. This is, uh, this is largely, this is Gary's work. Um, and it's designed to uh, approach the problem of redundancy in, uh, in, in gene sets. You upload, you, you do one of the over, exp over representation analyses you learned about yesterday, and you get 10 different uh, processes, and some of and some of them have very similar, some of them have similar names, some of them have different names. Are they really talking about the same process or different ones? And so what um, enrichment mapping does, and I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do this justice in the time that we have available, is to, um, is to compute the, 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 inter, the, the relationship between the, uh, uh, between the gene sets that are overexpressed in A versus B, or are over, um, overrepresented in A versus B, and, and B versus A, and to use that relationship to cluster those concepts together um, uh, to form a, 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 a network of lists where two lists will be close together if they're related by having similar in, enrichment or depletion profiles. Okay, so this is a type of, of relationship map. And what you get out of this, and I believe this is implemented as a this is implemented as a Cytoscape plugin, which you have. Yeah, sure. And which we'll do this afternoon. That's great. So you learn more about that. Okay, you get you get um, uh, you get these this nice network cluster in which each node is a um, is one of your lists, and it's connected to other nodes, other lists via a uh, um, a, a uh, weighted edge where the width of the edge is proportional 
to the amount of sharing of overrepresented or depleted genes in your set. Okay, and so you can get, this is a uh, set comparing sm uh, smokers to non-smokers. I don't know, is this lung tissue or something, Gary? Yeah, it was a small airway. Okay, so it's lung tissue. And so oxidative metabolism is, um, is reduced in the non-smokers, so they've gone, they're kind of anaerobic there. And all these genes, all these lists have to do with oxidative metabolism. Um, there's, a, there's a decrease in protein translation and uh, an increase, uh, fortunately, in detoxification pathways. And so there are three lists here that have to do with detoxification that I sequestered. And you can get a, a kind of a, a very nice conceptual mapping of the processes that are changing in your two sets from this, this methodology. Um, okay, very, I'm just, uh, I have to skip through this very quickly, but you can use, you can use network modules to classify diseases, to find biomarkers. So one of the problems, so one of the goals of, uh, molec uh, of molecular profiling of disease states is to identify, is to classify patients or samples via disease mechanism, response to drugs, clinical prognosis. So you'd like, for example, to find a, a breast a marker, a molecular marker in breast cancer, which will predict patients who have a, a long-term survival um, uh, and a, could be treated made less aggressively versus those that have predicted very aggressive disease, which who should probably be treated with all, with all guns going. Uh, or the patient, distinguished patients who are, respond to chemotherapy from those who, who won't. Uh, the problem with create, with biomarkers is you're doing, when you're trying to combine the results on 20,000 genes, you have many, many hypotheses. So you have many ways to combine them together. You have too many hypotheses to test. You get very little statistical power. And the idea, the general idea here is to create an active subnetwork where you have maybe 10 or 20 modules of related genes and then to create the biomarkers from there. So now instead of having 20,000 different combination, uh, uh, different things to test. You're testing a few dozen. And so, it's a very nice work done by, uh, in, in Trey Eidecker's lab at Rockefeller, uh, essentially does this. I won't go into the details, but here's the, here's the reference. You can read, you, you can read about it. They created a, um, a 50,000 interaction network from a number of sources, including um, uh, yeast 2 hybrid data and Reacto. Um, they then took two breast cancer cohorts uh, and, tr and tried to create a classifier that would distinguish between metastasis, patients with metastases and those without metastases. Um, they they, create, they um, created it, they, they extracted the subnetwork, they clustered it, they created a metric which uh, related the probability of a patient's uh, metastasis to the, to the modules, and then they combined them using a, a greedy algorithm. And they then create, then they got a, a, a series of modules whose presence was, was highly predictive of metastasis. Nicely, when they took two independent cohorts of breast cancer patients, they got a similar network, and the classification accuracy was um, uh, was both better than traditional biomarkers based on individual genes, and the modules had better coverage of known cancer risk genes. One of the problems with biomarkers is often you come up with genes which seem to have nothing to do with the process at hand. Okay, that's all I have time for there. And very quickly to touch on something that Quaid is, is going to talk about. Uh, you can use, you can use uh, network analysis to identify genes that have the, fun the probable function of genes that have uh, no known function. Uh, if many of your gene genes in your list have no known function, you can actually look at the genes in their neighborhood, and by the guilt by association mechanism, you can, um, uh, you can, you can make, some, make predictions. I wanted to show you an example of predicting oncogenes on the reactum functional network, but I, I, I'm not going to do that. You can, you can do that on your own free time. So, in conclusion, what have we learned here? Pathway databases provide excellent qualitative, inf qualitative information, but they vary considerably in their content, the curation policies, and their underlying data models. 
They're also restricted by their coverage, lack of coverage, and they're re really not good for quantitative hypothesis testing. Networks, and particularly interaction networks, which are constructed from integrating multiple data sources, provide better coverage of the genome and do not necessarily sacrifice accuracy over curation. Uh, when combined with pathway information, networks are a rapid way to provide clues to, uh, to mechanism, to, and they can use them to generate hypotheses to predict gene functions and to subclassify uh, patients and, and, and samples. And uh, that is that is it. Questions? <laughs>